My name is Belle Bergner. I'm the executive director of the North American Invasive Species Management Association. And I'm so happy to be with you here today to kick off the second week of National Invasive Species Awareness Week with today's webinar presenter, Carrie Brown Lima from the New York Invasive Species Research Institute. Carrie's going to talk about climate change and invasive species. I'm gonna give just a few introductory remarks and then turn it over to Carrie. All right. So for those who are new to NASMA, we are a 28 year old organization and our mission is to support, promote and empower invasive species prevention and management in North America. We do a, a variety, we provide a variety of services um, to our members and stakeholders, including um, international standards, uh, including mapping and weed-free products. We coordinate this and National Invasive Species Awareness Week and other education and advocacy efforts. We provide turnkey outreach and awareness tools for our members and stakeholders through the Play Clean Go program. Play Clean Go Awareness Week is coming up June 6th to the 12th. If you have not tuned into those free turnkey marketing and communication uh, opportunities, check that out. And professional development, including certification programs, webinars such as today's, trainings and our annual conference. Save the dates, come join us in September, late September in Montana. We will have, a, have an in-person conference as well as a hybrid and virtual conference if you are not able to travel. So save those dates. Registration is going to be opening very soon. And membership, if you are not a member, please check out the opportunities. We have a growing list of benefits. And if you don't see something that you need as an invasive species professional, let us know. Tell us how we can support you. So, and one final note for our members, we have a networking opportunity every first Friday of the month. They're really fun and the topics change every month. And this coming month in June, we'll, be, we'll focus our discussion around public education and outreach efforts. And with that, as a reminder, again, our mission is to support, promote and empower invasive species prevention and management in North America. And as I said before, please let us know if we are not providing a tool or resource or service that would be valuable to you, for you, let us know. We are here to support. With that, I am going to now introduce our speaker, Carrie Brown Lima. It is a great honor and pleasure to introduce Carrie. It's been very fun to work with her and get to know Carrie over the years. She is a, a board member of NASMA. Carrie is the director of the New York Invasive Species Research Institute at Cornell University. She works closely with research scientists, state and federal agencies, the New York Invasive Species Council and Advisory Committee, and regional managers and stakeholders to promote innovation and improve the scientific basis of invasive species management. Carrie has nearly 25 years of experience with natural resource conservation and management across ecosystems and borders. She spent more than a decade developing conservation strategies in Brazil and throughout Latin America, including programs such as sustainable fisheries certifications, agriculture and conservation and transboundary protected areas. So with that, I will turn it over to Carrie. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks for that introduction, Belle. And thank you so much for inviting me here today to talk about a topic that's really engaged me and interested me over the past five years. It's been one of the most uh, rewarding collaborations that I've formed. A lot of what I'll be presenting today is actually a product of the Northeast Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change Management Network, which is a collaboration between the University of Massachusetts, the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, and the New York Invasive Species Research Institute. And so this collaborative effort has taken me on a really interesting road and I'm looking forward to sharing some of the things that we've learned and developed over the past five years together. I'd like to give a shout out to the two found co-founders of The Risk With Me, Dr. Bethany Bradley, who's a professor at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, and Dr. Tony Limarelli, who is an ecologist at the Northeast CASC. And so with that, before I dive into the meat of my presentation, for those of you who aren't from New York, which I'm assuming as many of you on the phone, I just wanted to give a little bit of an overview of the New York Invasive Species Research Institute because it really is what brought me to address the issue of climate change and invasive species in my work. 
And the, U, the Institute is not actually an institute full of scientists that, is, that are there conducting research on invasive species, but instead we're a bridging organization that, that is designed to work at the interface of research and management. And our mission is to coordinate research, invasive species research, to help prevent and manage the impact of invasive species in New York State and beyond. And we're part of a bigger network of invasive species programming here in New York State where we have our partnerships for regional invasive species management as the core of the program. Those are boots on the ground who are out there forming partnerships to address invasive species in their region. And we have our local locational database, IMAP Invasives. We have an invasive species council, which is formed from nine uh, agencies here in New York State, our advisory committee, and all of that is overseen by the New York uh, Department of Environmental Conservation and funded through an uh, environmental protection fund. And so I get this opportunity to really work with this network of folks who are out there trying to solve invasive species problems. And it's given me a lot of insight into uh, the challenges they face. So back in 2016, many of you I'm sure recall, um, there was the amendment to the executive order on invasive species where President Obama is part of this amendment included that considering the impacts of climate change together when working on issues of invasive species prevention, eradication, and control would be a key part of the work. And meanwhile, at the same time, when I was speaking with my network here in New York, every year I solicit what their research needs are, I kept repeatedly hearing that people wanted to know how they could manage for the upcoming biological invasions in light of climate change. And so that's really what got me thinking and interested in this topic. And, and I'll be talking a little more about what came of that after I get through this initial whirlwind tour that I'm gonna give you of climate, base, climate change and invasive species. So just three main topics I'm gonna to cover today is uh, really climate change impacts and invasive species responses, initial recommendations to address these combined impacts, and how we can increase knowledge and tools to incorporate climate change considerations into invasive species management decisions. So um, getting started on the climate change aspect, you know, there's a number of indicators that we've used over time to that show us how the climate is changing. And these range from CO2 levels to growing seasons to average temperatures and so on. And some of these really, I'm going to highlight now, not in great depth, but because they actually are really driving factors in some of the interactions with invasive species. So first of all, as most of you know, rising CO2 levels um, have been occurring for several decades now. There are over 400 today. And CO2 is one of the main greenhouse gases that helps our planet to stay warm or get too warm. And together with that, we're seeing average temperatures on the rise. And a lot of this throughout my talk, you'll see I'm talking about the Northeast. Most of these things are, are pretty much throughout, you know, the U.S. And, and the world. But because a lot of my focus has been up here, you'll hear me talking about the Northeast quite a bit. But the Northeast average temperature is on the rise as well. And we are going to see in the next few decades that our climate is going to be a little bit more like Tennessee or even Georgia. And this is happening more at higher latitudes and at higher elevations. We're also seeing the seasons are shifting. The growing seasons are longer, the ice and snow cover is shorter, and we're just seeing a shift in the length of the warmer uh, areas are, the warmer seasons are extending and the colder seasons are shorter. And we're, we've been experiencing much milder winters with more frost-free and days than ever before, especially in the Western U.S. This is really happening at a, a greater rate. We're seeing earlier spring snowmelt, less snowfall overall, and we're seeing lake ice forming later and melting earlier. And which we can't seem to miss on the news, we're seeing an increased frequency of temperature and precipitation extremes and also extreme weather events, ranging from hurricanes to floods to heat waves and droughts that are uh, fueling the fires in the West. And so more and intense weather events. 
And these conditions together are really setting the stage to give invasive species a competitive edge. Now, invasive species are already great at adapting, and that's why they do so well in their new environment. And so they, they're able to adapt easier. And you'll see as we're moving forward to all these changes that are happening at a greater rate than some of our native species can adapt to. So most of you in your high school biology class or beyond learned how plants really love CO2. And under higher CO2 conditions, plants tend to grow faster and stronger. And you can see from these photos, the more CO2, the bigger the plant. However, when native species that do better under CO2 are compared to invasive species under the same CO2, the invasive species take advantage of that more and they do better. And they also get bigger, which makes them even harder to kill, which I'll touch back on in a little bit. And as we're seeing some of this melting of ice, we've all heard about the Arctic. We've all seen our polar bears stranded on, on a floating glacier, on a floating piece of ice here. And, but this is opening up new pathways for direct transport from the east to the west. And so these shipping routes are Well, can you hear me? I somehow got disconnected. Yeah, no. So the new pathways are opening up for invasive species to take a straight shot into a new environment, which is one of the top ways they get brought over here to begin with. We're also seeing, as I mentioned with that little circle, that we're seeing these warmer, that the world is, the Climate is warming up faster in the spring, earlier. We're seeing leaf outs much earlier than we used to. The growing season is extended. But as research is showing here is that in that situation, the invasive species are able to race and take advantage of that earlier growing season and uh, leaf out sooner. That gives them the early bird getting the worm kind of effect because they're taking up the nutrients, they're blocking out the sunlight from those that decide to uh, come out closer to the time that they were normally scheduled without climate change to come out. And so a lot of times if you're taking a walk out there this time of year or a little earlier in the spring, some of the green stuff that you're going to see is actually, is actually invasive species. And so they're getting this competitive advantage and leg up on the native. And this is not just happening in terrestrial environments. We're seeing warmer climates in warming water is giving invasive aquatic plants an advantage, even with uh, Eurasian water milfoil. The European one can grow, start growing sooner, have an extended uh, season compared to its native counterpart. When it comes to fish species, a good example is the brook trout and the brown trout. Brook trout are native species. And under normal uh, water temperatures, cool water temperatures, they can compete just fine with the brown trout. But as soon as the water starts warming up, they lose their competitive edge and aren't able to compete for resources in the same way they did previously. And so end up losing out when the, giving the invasive a competitive advantage. We're also seeing species on the move. And so as the climate is warming and opening up new areas that are desirable, species are being brought and established farther north. We carry them around without realizing it sometimes, but also they're just shifting their ranges. And so we call these our range shifting species. And you can see here that, that we are seeing them go farther and farther north into places where they weren't previously. And Jenica Allen and Bethany Bradley did some really neat work about five years ago when we were starting off this collaboration. And they were trying to project which species, which terrestrial plant species are likely to move into which regions under certain climate predictions. And so what they were really finding out is that we actually see that the Northeast and the Midwest are gonna be hot spots over the next 50 years for new species arriving. But that's not limited just to uh, terrestrial plant species. We're seeing forest pests also making the march north. Now, hemlock woolly adelgid, which is a really big problem here on the East Coast and becoming a bigger and bigger problem every year here in New York, was originally thought to, that it wouldn't be able to reach the northern latitudes. 
that it, because of the cold winters, that it would knock back its population enough and it wouldn't be able to become established. But now, as of a couple of years ago, we are finding hemlock willi adelgid established in some of our mountainous regions here in New York in places that original entomologists thought they would never survive. And so you can even see these are somewhat older predictions that the climate is warming faster and HWA is moving more quickly and adapting more quickly to these new places than was even projected years ago. And it's not just hemlock willi adelgid, I, another native species, but a very problematic pest in the south, the southern pine beetle, it used to only be in the south, thus the name southern pine beetle. And within the last five years, has moved up into New Jersey and New York and is devastating pine forests um, up this way as well. And again, we see aquatics making the move as well. Asian clams are increasingly adapting and moving to new places as well as water hyacinths. So this is really in all habitats that we're seeing these rain shifters occurring. And one thing, else, another that's really interesting, as I was mentioning with the reduced ice cover, we're also seeing less disturbance from ice scouring, which is an important process that happens in these aquatic systems. And it's thought that Didymo, or otherwise known as rock snot, was actually uh, kept at bay by the scouring. And now that we don't have the same amount of ice and the same degree of scouring, it's being allowed to spread and grow at a rate it was never able to in the past. Another thing that really a lot of times we don't focus on as much with land management agencies, and it goes sometimes to the health focused agencies, is the spread of uh, an impact of diseases that come along with invasive vectors like uh, the Asian tiger mosquito or just the dis invasive diseases themselves that are impacting wildlife like white nose syndrome. As it warms, we're, able, we're seeing Asian tiger mosquito spread and thus the, the, some of the more tropical diseases like dengue fever are being spread along with it. And there is suspicion that the white nose syndrome is actually exacerbated by the warmer climates and having greater damage on bat populations. However, this, the warming always being better for invasives is not a general rule. So I just wanted to point out that there are some species, as you can see from you know, this little arrow here pointing to the fact that some areas might actually see a decrease in invasive plant species, according to Jenica Allen and Bethany Bradley's model. And so it's not just a general rule that all species will do better. And for example, the European gypsy moth caterpillar can't do well in really warm climates. And so its range is retracting to the north and is less impactful in the south due to the warmer climate. So I also mentioned that, you know, we're going to see these more extreme events. And for example, hurricanes are creating disturbances that actually cause native mortality, mortality of trees, native trees, and opening up the opportunity for invasives to take over. And this study took place after uh, Hurricane Katrina in 2005. And in 2006, with the reduced tree canopy cover, you can see that the invasive blackberries grew at a much greater rate and took over as opposed to the native counterparts and the other understory plants. And so this is something that we really need to keep in mind as we're dealing with the effects, the after effects of extreme events. Droughts, of course, are becoming more common. And this study I think is really cool. Steve Frank and his student at the time, Adam Gale, down at North Carolina State University. They were actually looking at a native pest, the gloomy scale, but they set up a neat experiment where they were monitoring tr maple trees in the city. So the cities are usually a couple of degrees warmer, kind of simulating what it will be like when the climate warms a little bit. And then they promoted a little more drought by not letting water get down into the maples that were in the warmer climate, the city set up and then they compared those to trees that were right outside the town in a slightly cooler and moister environment. And they found that the drought induced trees were much more impacted by the pest, by the gloomy scale, had a lot more mortality and were just let, 
less productive and successful than the, their cooler counterparts. So this is a great little study to show how the warmer and the drought-induced environment will stress trees and help pests become more abundant. Another thing we need to be on the lookout for as the climate changes is what we've been calling sleeper species. And so these are non-native species that are present, but are not invasive because their growth is limited by some sort of biotic or abiotic condition, often the colder climate. So usually the, when climate's a limiting factor, if the climate warms up, they're released from that and they wake up. And so we're seeing this with some species. An example from the UK is the acorn barnacle that was present for 50 years until all of a sudden there were some mild winters and then its population exploded. And there's other species that we have here that are just naturalized, they're just hanging out, they're not really doing anything, but there's concern and we should be on the lookout for the potential that should the climate change, they might become problematic moving forward. And I just wanted to circle back a little to the reduced effect, efficacy of control methods. Lou Ziska did this study several years ago, but still a great study that looked at a Canada thistle. It was typically controlled by glyphosate. And when he put Canada thistle under future CO2 conditions, he actually found that the efficacy went way down and that because they were stronger and bigger, that it wasn't really as successful at killing the, the plant as it had been before. And as we start evaluating some of our other control methods like biological control, more and more research is being conducted right now to try to understand what's gonna happen to biocontrol agents that we really depend on for sustainable management of a lot of invasive species here in North America to try to understand what's gonna happen as the climate changes. Because really what's important about biocontrols is that they're matched up well with their target invasive. And so if each of the agent or the invasive species, the target invasive, were to shift their phenology in a different way, there might be a decoupling and those might not be effective anymore. They could change their growth and reproductive rate or they could shift their ranges as well. So there's this potential for a mismatch. A match that was previously made will no longer be working out. And so, you know, we'll be likely be hearing more and more about that in the years to come because there's a lot of great research going on. And I just wanted to switch, flip the conversation for one slide here to say that we talk a lot about how climate change is impacting invasive species, but there's also the idea out there that invasive species are actually could be contributing to uh, climate change. As we're losing so much of our forests to invasive forest pests, we are actually losing the potential for carbon sequestration. And so studies right now are trying to understand you know, what level that's actually happening at and whether that's you know, yet one more blow to, to our fight against raising, rising climate, rising uh, temperatures. And finally, this is, uh, I threw this one in because this is something that has become a bigger conversation as you know, previously harmless native species become a nuisance under changing climate and shift their range. And we've been calling these nuisance neonatives. They're range shifting species that have established themselves beyond their historical range. And black locust is one of those that's increasingly becoming a problem here in the Northeast and moving up from its Southern native zone. So just to wrap up this first section, you know, the opportunities that climate change is providing for invasive species, increased growth and density of invasives due to higher CO2, hardier invasives under higher CO2 show resistance to herbicide treatment, potential reduced effectiveness of biocontrols if the phenology or other aspects of their biology are mismatched, earlier green up in priority effect for invasives and other competitive advantages, We've got the rain shifters going north, increased establishment due to disturbances from extreme events, waking up our sleeper species, losing carbon storage opportunities, facilitating wildlife and human diseases, and then um, the challenging situation of nuisance neonatives. And so as we have all of these uh, different impacts happening and we are seeing all these relationships, it's, we need to start wrapping our head around what to do about them. 
And so we've been exploring within the risk group some of the, the solutions that could potentially come or ways we could start at least framing our thinking on invasive species and climate change. So first of all, the first area that we, we were proposing is some strategic planning. So identifying and prioritizing vulnerable areas, planning for invasive species detection and management after extreme events, and including invasive species considerations into climate adaptation plans to make sure that they're on the radar and that people are looking out for these when, when they're likely to come about. We can also think about preventative management. Instead of planting potential sleeper species or species that seem harmless enough now but might become problematic later, really focusing on climate resilient native species when we're planting and um, doing restoration efforts. Creating a watch list for rain shifting invasives so that we know what we're looking for and know how to identify them when they show up. And then seeking solutions related to treatment and control. You know, we've seen from the previous slides that these invasive species are able to extend their growing season and change uh, their growing season. So we need to adapt our treatment to those, grow those changed seasons. And also we need to incorporate resistance in diverse treatment methods uh, to compensate for the fact that some of our current methods might not be effective moving forward. And when I'm talking about, it, I just wanna go back to the first bullet, adapting to shifts in growing seasons. That's not just for treating invasive plant, terrestrial plants. We can think about even boat wash stations that might need to go beyond the Memorial to Labor Day schedule that they've been on previously. And also conducting rapid response when rain shifting species are detected, not waiting for things to get worse. We can also educate and share what we know, educate ourselves and share what we know with others and stay up to date on new information so we can be ready. So the fact that you're here at this webinar is a great first step in that. And also then sharing what you know with your colleagues and stakeholders, as well as researchers addressing these issues because we're all really learning about how to deal with it. And so sometimes it's not published in the scientific literature, but there is a lot of knowledge out there that we should be sharing with each other. And finally, um, in the solutions category, thinking about the way policies um, should change. So developing policies that consider climate change impacts on invasives, being proactive to include regulation for future potential invasive rain shifters, which I'll talk a little bit about in my coming slides, streamlining the process to include new species in these regulations and including invasive species issues in climate change policy and planning. And so, you know, there's a lot to be learned, a lot of solutions that we're still seeking and a lot of information that we still don't, or um, information gaps still out there. So I, what I'd like to do for the rest of my time here, let me see how I'm doing, is really hone in on a path to generating this information and sharing it among our network of professionals that are working in this field. So getting back, I'm, I'm talking about President Obama a lot today, but in this executive amendment to the executive order, he also really emphasized the need to consider opportunities to apply innovative science and technology. And th the innovation summit happened right around the time that amendment came out that was really that was focusing on science and information and technology as a, as the key to us you know gaining some ground against invasives and you know it's not a new idea that science is important for tackling on the ground issues i really like this quote from from woodrow woodrow wilson from about 100 years ago the man has the time the discrimination and the sagacity to collect and comprehend the principal facts and the man who must act upon them must draw near to one another and feel they are engaged in a common enterprise and so the idea that we really need to join practitioners and the academic world to solve these problems is, is something that we should be focusing on moving forward. And you know, thankfully, we do have a lot of research that's been published in the recent years. It's been a drastic uh, increase in the number of invasive species publications and the amount of things we've learned. 
However, despite all the new information we have out there, Virginia Madsec back in 2014 coined the knowing doing gap in invasive species management and research because she identified that there was this gap between research and practice so that the scientific information accumulates but isn't actually incorporated into management actions. And she went on to try to figure out why. So she asked a bunch of invasive plant managers out West what, where they get their information that helps them make the decisions that they need to make. And most of them said that they get them from informal conversations and learning from their own experiments. You know, some written material that synthesized in books and newsletters and websites, attending conference and symposium attendance, and peer-reviewed journals. And if this was really to scale, uh, peer-reviewed journals would be pretty far down the totem pole from um, these other ways people are learning. So it really shows us that you know, just publishing something isn't enough. But another thing that she found out in her further research is that sometimes the information that's in the scientific literature doesn't actually answer the question that people have and is not in the right context to help us make better decisions. And she went on to find that this mismatch in what researchers and stakeholders, what researchers are doing and what stakeholders are asking for or what they're needing is actually, there's this, they're not lined up. And this really shows us that there needs to be more communication between the two worlds for us to be able to solve difficult issues together like climate change and invasive species. So along that vein, we've really been honing in on this concept of translational invasion ecology, which is it's an approach that embodies an intentional and inclusive process in which researchers, stakeholders, and decision makers collaborate to develop and implement research via joint consideration of the sociological, ecological, economic, and political context of the problem of invasive species. And so this realm in the middle is actually the realm of a bridging organization or some sort of connector that can bring the two worlds together and promote collaboration and communication between practice and research. And we've been thinking about a process that the step-by-step -step process on how translational invasion ecology happens. And we actually have a paper in review in biological invasions headed up by Tony Lynn Morelli, but that it actually emphasizes the need to go through these steps to make those connections happen. So just circling back to what brought me here to begin with was this idea that the practitioners were asking for guidance from the researchers on how to deal with climate change and invasive species. And as I mentioned before, I was really lucky to connect with two researchers who were open and interested in engaging in this way and trying to help figure out you know, how we can tackle two of the biggest threats to biodiversity together, that's climate change and invasive species. So back in 2016, we found the Northeast Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change Management Network, which from now on I'm going to call RISC, with the sole purpose to reduce the compounding effects of invasive species and climate change by synthesizing the science, by communicating the needs of managers to researchers, and building these strong scientist-manager communities, and then conducting some of the priority research that comes out of it. And I've been so thrilled to be a part of this team that right now we have over 500 people in our network and have an ever-growing leadership team that's a lot of researchers, but also really grateful for the managers that have contributed to our conversations to make sure we stay on track and, and that our, we're addressing the right questions. And with that in mind, back when the group formed, Eve Bowery led this, this research to try to understand, it was a survey similar to that of Maztec, to try to understand from managers how they're incorporating climate change into invasive species management and what they need to know in order to do that better. And really what she found out from this study was that lack of information was a huge barrier to including climate change. And at that time, we had so much less focus on this topic. And so the information was just kind of scattered throughout the research and wasn't really easily accessible to people who read the journals, let alone people who just needed the information but weren't sifting through journals on a daily basis. And so the risk group started doing something in response to that. And we would do, we've been doing research summaries ever since where we find a relevant article, we boil it down, summarize it, do the, give some take home messages for management 
and we circulate it on our listserv and publish it on our website so that that information is easy to get at. However, some of the topics like sleeper species that I was talking about earlier or warming waters actually needed more research to be synthesized into one place. So it wasn't just one article. So we started um, producing and we have a whole series now that are available on this risk network website. We call them management challenges that are starting to address some of the issues that, that were the top concerns of the manager. And within that, actually, though, is that there's all this knowledge in, you know, practitioners that doesn't necessarily get published. So we also have conducted um, some workshops to try to get that information and synthesize information for managers on how we can, for example, take action. Like a lot of the, all of the points that I was talking about as the solutions came out as a result of these discussions with large manager groups to try to figure out how we could be moving towards addressing invasive species and climate change on the ground. Much like Maztec, we were trying to figure out where people were getting their information from, here in the Northeast at least, because we wanted to know how we should be pushing out the information that we had. And we really, these top two one-on-one -on -one conversations and meetings and symposia really came out as an important way of sharing information. So since that time, we've hosted annual symposia and workshops to really promote this network building and information sharing. We also asked them what their research priorities were directly and found that these came out on top. And I'd like to, for the next few minutes and the last few minutes of my talk, just give an example of how we chose one of these topics and how we actually took it from research to implementation. So rain shifting species, as I mentioned, was already some research that Bethany Bradley and Jenica Allen had been advancing to begin with, so it was a great place to start. And as uh, species are moving, the changing climate, new ecosystems, as I showed you before, we see species like water primrose moving north that's native to South America, but being able to make its way up. And so that was just an example of the way that species are moving. but as we're thinking about species like that moving, we know that the best place to work on invasive species is down here at the lower end of the invasion curve. So for those of you, I'm sure everyone on this call has seen this at some point, but if you haven't, this basically just tells us that the most cost-effective way to deal with invasive species is to prevent them from coming in or detecting them early and eradicating them. Once we have a widespread population of an invasive species, we're really just protecting our assets and trying to snuff out populations where we can, but we're really never going to get rid of it. So rain shifters actually provide us an opportunity, if we know something is likely to move in, to prevent it before it comes. And so with that, we can look at the current distribution and we can look at some of these projections on where species are likely to move. And then we can start using those um, projections to generate state or county lists of species that we should be looking out for. Now, since everybody's not going to be able to call up a researcher that's doing these models to ask them which species are moving into their county, Jenica partnered up with EDMAP with funding from the Northeast ITM Center and developed a tool where you can actually go in and identify where you live, choose some certain criteria on which climate projections and which species are, and it will generate a list for you of uh, which species are likely to move in. So right here is just an example of what species are likely to expand the ranges by 2020 into New York and Southern New England. However, there's 100 species on this list, so it would be really tough to put watch lists out, watch efforts out, and detect early detection efforts out for that many species or to regulate that many species. And so the group has also, some of the students in the risk group started evaluating these species using ICAT, which is an environmental impact classification for alien taxa, to try to see which ones were likely to be the worst ones that we should be the most concerned about and then ranked those species that came off the list. And that was really helpful. They did it for us here in New York. So we were able to have this list. We actually put this list through our assessment processes so we could see which ones would um, fit the bill for being regulated and prohibited here in the state. And then we actually put that in, you know, formalized that into our prohibited invasive species list. 
And, you know, just uh, for reference, we up until that point had really been listing mostly species that were already here. So this was a real proactive step to preventing some of these species from get, starting to be used, say, in horticulture or being moved around. So if you're interested in seeing a little more information on this, you can get the publication from the from Biological Invasions or the Management Challenge that summarizes how that works. And speaking of proactivity, we're really lucky here in New York to have the resources and the connections to know what species were coming and start, or what species were likely to come and start listing them. But a lot of states um, aren't able to be as proactive because they don't know the list and they also just don't have the resources to do that. So a lot of times they're re uh, regulating after the fact. And so then we lose that opportunity for prevention or early detection. And we also, you know, as we're all states and invasive species don't know when they're crossing a border, it would be good if we got all of our regulations, you know, lined up. And what we've been finding by talking, looking at some of the plant lists and some of the regulated species lists is that they vary a lot from state to state, even those that are um, overlapping or that are next to each other. So really promoting these discussions to try to get people together. We hosted a workshop right before COVID hit to bring the plant council members from seven Northeast states together to talk about listing processes and how we can be more proactive. So that was just one example of a way through partnerships with researchers, managers, and good communication, we can start um, addressing this issue. And so just, you know, in wrapping up here, you know, climate change, trying to bring this to a positive note, climate change really does create new risks from invasive species, and we need to understand those and be on the lookout. But there is opportunity for us to band together and work together to share knowledge and hopefully we can prevent future invasion more effectively and learn how to reduce some of the impacts of invasive species and climate change. And I know I mentioned, I was talking a lot about the Northeast. We're really excited because other regions of the North US have been replicating uh, and joining forces with our Northeast risk effort. And they've just recently established a North Central risk, a Pacific Islands risk, and a Northwest risk to work on more regional issues, but also we'll all be joining together as a national risk to help share knowledge at the national level. So with that, I'll wrap up. Hopefully I've left some time for some questions and I do invite you to check out the webpage and join this effort moving forward. So thanks so much everyone for listening and I'm happy to answer any questions that you all have. Thank you so much, Carrie. That was great. We do have a bunch of questions. We'll try to get through as many as we can. And whatever we don't get through, we'll copy and we'll ask Carrie to help answer. And then we'll post those on the YouTube, our NASMA's YouTube channel, where this recording will be posted after today. All right. So um, the first question was a request. If you could put that summary slide back up. You had a summary slide, yeah, a little bit ways ago as we wrap up. <laughs> that was really helpful. Sure. No problem. Uh, I'm almost there, sorry, let me just, was it the summary of the impact, I'm assuming, there we go, is that the one? Um, I, okay. I'm assume, I'll assume so, I'll let Mary uh, let us know in the chat if that's the one you were talking about. Okay, let's go to the next question. What was the name of that assessment method that you had applied uh, to predict which species will be invasive? So it, it's actually like it's an impact of the assessment method. So there's a tool to predict which species are rain shifting and likely to move into an area. And then there's also a methodology for assessing the impact of species. So seeing how bad, how much of a negative impact they would have. And that is the ICAT. And I can type that in the chat box. If you. That's great. Oh wait, I thought this might just go to all panelists here. There are all panelists in it. Okay, and I can pull that back up in a couple minutes as well, if that would be helpful. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, all right, next question. Interesting prediction on the reduction of invasive plants in some areas. Is that largely because of water and temperature that limits invasive tendencies? Or is it something else? Yeah, so in the case of the plant, I don't actually know what the factors were that they were calculating and that would 
it, it was really looking at like habitat that certain species are adapted to. And so it looks like we'd be getting more. <laughs> I don't really know exactly. I'm assuming that it was that there would, it would be a higher temperature limiting their expansion that maybe they wouldn't thrive as much. But yeah, I don't know the details of that one. Okay, great. Yeah, it's, uh, you mentioned it's, it's a complicated and yeah, site dependent question perhaps. All right, so let's see next question. I guess this question is getting at like, at what point do you throw your hands up or do you allow yourself to ha throw your hands up? Which the question is, is it not possible to, here it is, where did it go? Is it not really an option or solution to try to coexist with invasive species? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think we are always going to coexist with invasive species. I think what we need to be able to do is to avoid introducing new ones. We need to pick our battles when we know that's why some of these methodologies for looking at impact and really understanding impacts are important because we know what impacts we want to try to avoid. But yeah, I think we're certainly going to always be coexisting with invasive species and we're just going to have to be strategic because we're never going to get rid of all of them. We just need to make sure we do the best, make the best use of our resources. And I think that's where science is so important to help guide those decisions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, we have a attendee from the Great Lakes region who asks if, if you could speak to any projected impacts in this region, particularly aquatic invasives such as zebras and zebra and quagga mussels. Yeah, so I can't speak specifically to zebra and quagga mussels. I do, I have seen that there is a tendency for like Asian clam, as I mentioned, is moving north. You might actually see the arrival of new species that couldn't previously survive. Whether that, whether that will push in quagga, zebra and quagga mussels out a little bit, I have no idea. But there's definitely the, the tendency for new species to be um, introduced and be able to survive that wouldn't previously survive when the conditions were cooler. Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah. All right, next question. How do species we are considering invasive stay quote unquote in check in their native ranges or are they becoming problematic there too? Yeah, so um, partially sometimes it's actually native predators. So when something is in its native range, it has usually has things that will feed on it or that, you know, a pathogen that will keep it from growing or expanding, or there's some limiting factors could be climate wise or um, otherwise. But when it comes to its new range, there, that's when it loses, it leaves a lot of its predators or herbivores behind and is able to explode in population. And that's not always the case, but that's the whole mess. That's the whole idea behind biological control for controlling invasive species is that you actually bring one of those or more of those to the introduced range. And interestingly, sometimes we know something might be a, a bother in the introduced range, but I've actually seen a number of examples of species that were rare in their native range. And it was only when they got to their, the introduced range that they became problematic. So. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I love this next question because as this is National Invasive Species Awareness Week, the question is how do we make everyone more aware? So specifically, how can the general public be engaged more as stakeholders? What can they do? And for local governments as well, any tips or suggestions there? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think that invasive species sometimes is a problem that seems so big that people feel like, oh, we just have to accept this and there's nothing we can do. But actually, there's a lot we can do on an individual level to stop spreading invasive species around, to stop introducing new species to a place. And so, you know, Play Clean Go is a great example of, you know, making sure you're cleaning your boat before you move from one water body to another water body. That's how, uh, most invasive species make their way into a new disconnected water body is through us, right? Brushing off the bottom of your shoes, you know, getting that message out, don't move firewood far from its origin because it could have forest pests in it. And those are all things that you know, the public can easily adapt to. And as, you know, cities, counties can also help support those efforts by informing people and providing the resources for them to do that. 
So, you know, state campgrounds can sell at a reasonable price firewood so that people are encouraged to buy it there rather than them wanting to check it from their home far away and bring new things in. So I think there's definitely a role I think that we need to communicate what that clearly what those actions are. And I think, you know, NASM has been doing a really great job of getting, you know, more standardized messaging out so that we're all on the same page with what we're telling people. And I think that, that that's been a great advance that, you know, can I tip my hat to to Belle and her crew for making that that happen at a nationwide level. Yeah, agreed. And I'll tip my hat to the designers of the Play Clean Go campaign, the original designers and Clean Drain Dry, Don't Move Firewood, Hungry Pests, all of us are working together to make sure we're all sharing the same consistent message. So yeah, if you're not aware of those campaigns, um, again, Play Clean Go or Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers, Clean Drain Dry, check them all out. And Play Clean Go in particular, we've got uh, turnkey resources for Play Clean Go Awareness Week that include a lot of those same campaigns all in the same outreach messaging opportunities. Okay, we got time for one more question. Let's see, we got through most of these. Let's see, does, how about, does overuse of land or erosion or, or lack of proper land management contribute to invasive species issues with challenge, with climate change? I'm sorry, could you read that again? I was scrolling looking for it. Okay, it's a little bit towards the end. Nancy's wrote, does overuse of land and erosion and lack of proper land management, is it a contributor to invasive species challenges with climate change? Yeah, for sure. I mean, invasive species really thrive in disturbed areas. And so they're great at taking hold and becoming established in, in those situations. So for sure, lack of proper land management, lack of, or, you know, not maintaining, you know, habitats intact certainly opens up the door. And that was one of the things even with our extreme events that you know, cause this disturbance. But yeah, erosion as well can can be very problematic. So mm -hmm. for sure. Okay, I'm gonna throw in one more question here because we do have two and a half minutes left. There's a question about uh, if you can talk a little bit more about how invasive species may cause loss of carbon storage opportunities. And then Scott Cameron typed right below there an example of cheatgrass putting out more CO2 in the atmosphere because it burns up. Yeah, so for sure. I mean, we are losing so much forest. Forest pests to me are one of the scariest invasives that we need to be thinking about because we are just losing a lot of our native trees and those that's what we depend on for carbon storage. And so, you know, these papers and I can put those back up, do a do a nice job of starting to address that issue and trying to put some numbers on it. And I don't unfortunately know those off the top of my head. But it, it's, it's a real consideration that we need to think about as we're seeing so many new pests come through. And with climate change, their ability to spread throughout the range of these, some of these tree species is, is you know, really concerning. And it should be something that, we, you know, as we're thinking about climate change policy and priorities, that should be a topic that's on the list. And so, yeah, thank you, Scott, for putting in the, the cheatgrass example as well. All right, with that, I wanna thank Carrie again for this great presentation. I'm gonna put up my closing slides and I wanna thank everyone again for joining us today. Uh, a special thank you to NASMA's staff also for organizing and communicating about National Invasive Species Awareness Week opportunities. If you've not tuned into the NASMA and NISA channels on social media or on our websites, please check those out for additional opportunities to help get the word out. So there's a, also an events map if you haven't if you have an event, whoops, sorry, and you'd like us to help promote it, you can post it on our map at nasma.org or nisa.org. Sign up for the other webinars happening for the rest of this week. We have a webinar each day. There are free turnkey outreach resources, easy to plug and play, social media graphics and press release templates and a bunch of other things. So check that out. Again, fo so follow us if you aren't already also on social media. And just here's a list of other webinars coming up this week. I'll let you take a moment to look at those. I won't read them all, but you can see them all at nisa.org. And uh, yeah, there's some fantastic other webinars coming up this week. So with that, thank you again for joining us. And thank you again, Carrie, for the great presentation. As mentioned before, this presentation was recorded and will be posted on NASMA's YouTube channel. So if you uh, would like to hear it again or would like to forward it to a colleague, it will be there 
um, forever. So again, thanks again, Carrie, and have a great rest of the week, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Belle, for the invitation.